Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today we're going to be talking about why quantum mechanics cannot rescue free will. And it's kind of interesting we're doing this today, because if I had a free will, I would not do this show today. I've been wanting to do this show for weeks and weeks, because it's an important show. But like, like last night I was in Manhattan, like doing our live cable show and you know on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I didn't get home until like two o'clock, then I didn't get to sleep till five, <laughs> then I decided to play guitar for an hour because I got on the computer and I wanted I don't know. So anyway, so like um but you know I find myself doing this and it's an important show because like, you know, for decades people have like, you know, just wrongly um kind of like attributed the results of quantum mechanics what quantum mechanics is about to this free will question and so this episode is going to like clarify the matter for for us okay um so let, let's and you know bef before we go uh with that let's just briefly describe what we mean when we say free will and why the why this topic is important okay if we had a free will we would be able to decide anything we wanted, do anything we wanted, you know, within physical limits, whatever, um, think whatever we wanted, feel whatever we wanted, uh, without anything that we're not in control of doing that for us, determining that for us, um, making us do that. Um, and naturally, the you know, we, we can't do that. Um, the reason it's important, because like, when, when, when we subscribe to and, and live our lives according to this illusion of free will, well, firstly, it's insane. It's completely insane. Couldn't be more insane. I mean, just like to believe that we're the authors of our actions and thoughts. And, hey, how come the clock isn't moving? To believe that we're the authors of our, um, of our clocks is like, it, it just doesn't make sense. But um, anyway, and, and that's, that's why it's important. But the other thing is like, you know, to the extent that we, um, to the extent that we buy into this illusion of free will, the clock's still not going. The, um, to the extent that we're, um, we believe we have a free will, when other people do long, like let's say, all right, this clock isn't, you know, it's just like static there. I don't know, now, whatever. But like, if I believe that, that um, we had a free will, I would say, all right, well, there's a person, you know, whoever that person might be that did something wrong and that, that might lead to blame and whatever. And this, this goes with anything, you know, like, you know, we do wrong. We're human beings. We do wrong all the time. Other people do wrong. When we believe we have a free will and when we believe other people have a free will, when we do wrong, then we will blame others. So what happens when, when we realize we don't have a free will? We don't blame others for anything. We don't blame ourselves for anything. We blame the universe because, like, you know, the universe, I mean, who else are you going to blame? And again, we, I just did a show on how um, God can't have a free will either. So you can't really even blame the universe, which is like, you know, it's a surreal reality. But, but that's the way it is. Okay. All right. So let's, let's get into this. So basically the idea is, like, to the extent that humanity, that our world overcomes this illusion of free will, we can create a saner, kinder, more intelligent world, you know, in a lot of ways. All right, um, so the basic reason free will is an illusion, it's impossible, is because of this principle, this process, which is the fundamental process in nature. It's causality. Let me explain this a bit. Okay. Our universe is in motion. We're not static. You know, things move. If, if, if things didn't move, nothing would happen. Think about it that way. So change change is the fundamental process of the universe and change is really that like one thing whether it's a particle or a planet or whatever is in a certain state is a certain position in space whatever at one time you know at one moment and the next moment it's at a different position whatever that's change change is like something being in one state at one moment and being in a different state in another you know there's there's something different you know about whatever okay so um, now when you think about it, um, you can't have change, you can't have things happening without causality. In other words, like something, if, if there's a change in a particle, if a, if a particle is at one 
position in one moment and it's in a different position the next moment, there has to be a reason, there has to be a cause. So that, that leads us to this axiom in this, this like, you know, um, a priori, priori fact that um, everything must have a cause. And, you know, sometimes I say, well, God is the cause of God, but that, we don't have to go back that far. But like, everything in the universe must have a cause. Nothing can happen that's not caused, okay? And that is the basic refutation of free will. Now, here's the thing, like back before quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics was developed in the early 1900s, around 1925, 27, by Warner Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, uh, Schrodinger, several other, you know, physicists. And, okay, before that, in physics, um, the way they made predictions about, like, how particles, how matter would behave in the future is they would, like, for example, with a particle, they would measure the position of the particle and its momentum. The mom momentum is, like, the... Um, velocity and direction that the particle is going in, you know. So, so basically, by, by knowing the position and the momentum of a particle in classical me mechanics, this is like the me mechanics, the, the physics that um, Isaac Newton invented, discovered, whatever, um, you can make predictions that way, okay? So, so what happens? Um, Warner Heisenberg, 1925-27, he publishes a paper, um, presents the, uh, the fact, nobody disputes this, that um, while, while with large objects like, you know, let's say a, a grapefruit, um, a baseball or something, you can do that. You can simultaneously measure the position and, and momentum of, let's say, a baseball, and you can get a prediction that way. When it comes to really small particles, you can't. And I want to try to explain this, you know, kind of like graphically in a way. Um, if you're gonna, if you're gonna measure a baseball, okay, um, the position and momentum of a baseball, you would use like, let's say, a photon. You know, you'd fire a photon on it. You know, you, you've seen like in baseball games, they have those kind of machines that they'll tell you how fast the pitch was pitched. That's what they're basically doing. They're basically like measuring the position and momentum of the baseball as, as it travels through space. So if you can do that, you know, you can get an accurate prediction. Now, here's the thing. If you're, if you're firing a photon at a baseball, the photon is tiny, 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 okay? And, um, and the baseball is really big. So like when the, when the photon impacts on the baseball, because that's what it has to happen for it to measure it, it has to like impact with it. Um, the photon is so small, it's not going to change either the position or the trajectory, the momentum of the baseball. And that's why you can get a accurate... Now, actually, you know, to be completely truthful, it will change it, but it will change it so minutely that it just doesn't affect the prediction. Okay, so at the quantum level, what happens, though, is like you've got a photon and you're, let's say, firing it at an electron. You know, you want to measure the, um, the position and, and momentum of an electron. Um, the problem there is like the difference in size between the photon and the electron isn't as great as between a photon and a baseball. So, um, so what happens is each time when you, when you fire a photon at an electron to measure it, it's not like, here's like the, the electron, you fire the proton at it, just the, the impact is going to change the, the momentum and, and position of that electron. You know, that, that's what happens. And that, that's kind of like a physical explanation of why, um, why at the quantum level with, with subatomic, you know, particles, you can't use the, this, this classical Newtonian method for, um, for arriving at predictions, okay? So, and this, you know, this was kind of formulated uh, mathematically. Um, you know, mathematics is kind of like a description of reality. So, like, Warner Heisenberg, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, he published his Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. And basically it means that, like, you, you know, you can't simultaneously measure 
the position and momentum of a particle, period, okay? Um, and that's all it says. That's all it says. You can't do that. And um, I've got to figure out how to explain this. All right. The, the basic thing is, like, so what? All right, you can't, you know, because like, what happened is, like, when, um, when he presented this back in the 20s, you know, people were pretty much, they, they understood that free will had to be an illusion, at least according to the physics um, perspective, because causality, you know, cause and effect simply negated. And, and, um, and Newtonian classical mechanics is completely causal. Some people, some people were claiming, well, this, at the quantum level, because you simultaneously can't measure the, the position and momentum of a particle, somehow that behavior is not causal. And that was a mistake. There's absolutely no logical um, reason for saying that, no, no substantive evidence for that. It's just like it was a mistaken conclusion. It was, making, it was made by, I think, very intelligent people. This guy Heisenberg you know, reached that conclusion. Bohr reached it, several others. Einstein Stein tried to prove him wrong, but he went about it in the wrong way. I want to get into this, actually. Einstein tried to prove him wrong by, by um, use of a proxy um, measurement. In other words, he, he suggested, all right, we'll, we'll measure the position with one particle, we'll measure the momentum with the second particle, and I think this, this is like the einstein Palant podaski um, rosen experiment, that um, if you do that, then by proxy, using a proxy measurement, you can achieve you know, accurate measurements of position, simultaneous measurements of position and momentum at the quantum level. Um, it turned out like that doesn't work either, but, but actually I thought of a, you know, theoretically, I mean, what he, what he should have said is like, basically what's, what's preventing us from simultaneously measuring the position and, and momentum of a particle at the quantum level is the ratio between the, the measuring particle and the object to be measured, the, the, the target particle. Uh, the theory is that like, for example, if, if we could discover, I mean, there are like, you know, there are bosons, there are quarks, there are these really, really tiny particles, neutrinos. If we could, let's say, use a neutrino that's small enough, like these neutrinos are small enough, they could like go right through the entire Earth without touching another, um, you know, particle. That's how small they are. If we use, let's say, a neutrino to measure an electron, the, the difference between the electron and the neutrino would be similar to the difference between a photon and a baseball. Remember, we were describing this before as how, you know, we can um, accurately measure simultaneously position and momentum, you know, in the macro world. So that's the idea. Theoretically, Einstein should have, I think, gone that route. It was, it's a theoretical kind of um, explanation, but it's, it's more, it's clearer. And um, I wrote a paper about this, actually. Um, so, all right, so anyway. Um, <clears throat> so now, all right, here's the other thing. Um, some people claim that because you can't simultaneously measure the position and momentum of a particle, you know, subatomic particle, that, that somehow that behavior is not causal. You know that, that that you know that there's no cause to that, but but that makes no sense at all, because like actually, um, quantum mechanics is causal. The way quantum mechanics works, I mean, like you know, a basic you know ballpark explanation, whatever, is um, they'll they'll all right. You can't simultaneously measure the the position and moment of of a single particle, okay, with quantum with the quantum um whatever with with, with um with apparatus and all. But what they do instead is they measure the position simultaneously and momentum of groups of particles, you know. And, and like, so after they do that, you know, a, a good number of times, then through that measurement, they can know that the, the um, they can predict. They can they can um, predict the behavior of a single particle. In other words, it's it's the measurement. It's the simultaneous 
measurement of the position and momentum of groups of particles that, that allows them to then um, be able to, like, through the equations, through the mathematics, then derive from that the behavior, the prediction of a single particle. Now, think about this, like, um, to claim that, that the particle behavior at a quantum level isn't causal, it's kind of like claiming that, well, you know, a particle, when it's like traveling on its own, is traveling randomly, which, you know, which, which technically really means a causally, without cause, which is like incoherent. I'll get into that. But, um, but basically, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. All right. Um, okay. Um, oh, yeah. All right. So to claim, I got it. To claim that, um, that, that a single particle, you know, is a causal as a single particle, but when it comes together with a group of particles, all of a sudden is endowed with, with, um, with a causal nature. You know, it's not subject to causality as a single particle, but when it's in a group, it, it is subject. That, is, that makes no sense, okay? But anyway, that's... Um, so quantum mechanics, you know, um, basically uses groups of particles to, to derive their predictions, and they're incredibly accurate predictions. They can, they can measure, like, you know, the distance between New York here and California within a hair's breadth, you know, I mean, like, really, really accurately. Okay, um, I hope you're getting this. This is kind of a little involved, because this is basically just addressing causality and randomness. Now, there's other stuff at the quantum level that doesn't make sense. And unless, I'll just address one. There's several things. Um, there's something called the double slit experiment. Um, all right, you fire a photon at a plate that has two slits, okay, in it, and then there's a plate behind it. So what happens is the photon is going to, when it hits the, because you have to realize a particle has its particle nature and it also has its wave nature. So what happens is when the, when the, the wave nature of this particle um, reaches that panel with the two slits, it's going to divide. At the other end, when it's, because it's going to travel through it, then all of a sudden you're going to have two waves, okay? You're going to have two waves come out at the other side, and then you've got a plate behind it. And what happens is, like, the waves have, like, the um, crests and troughs and all. They, they, it's kind of like, you know, up and down kind of thing. And what happens is, like, when, um, when, um, when the waves are in sync in a certain way, then what happens um, and in, the, um, in the second plate is you'll get the, what's known as an interference pattern. You know, the, the, the waves, the, the troughs and the crests kind of li line up, and you'll get this pattern, this ribbon of, of lighter and darker um, bands that are, that are caused by the interference. Okay, um, so... They, we don't know, no, no, here's the thing, all right, so, so if, you're, if, you're, if you're firing, let's say, a stream of photons, um, you know, at this first panel with the double slit, and, then the, and you see it in the, the second panel, you know, you detect it, um, okay, um, hold on, um, if, all right, um, I'm trying to explain this, if, if you, um, Okay, if, 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 that, if you do that, then, um, all right, if you do it with a stream, I got to explain. I, I was in Manhattan last night. Did I explain this earlier? I don't know. Like, I didn't get home till like 2, and I'm, I'm, I'm working on like a couple hours sleep. Yeah, I, I explained this. All right, so, so um, all right, what happens is like with a stream, with a stream, it's easy to kind of like see how, like it, how the bands, um, you know, form. But what's a, what the mystery is, like, let's say you fire a single photon, okay? And it'll go through, like, the two slits, and, you know, let's say a, a light part or a dark part will, will reach... Um, this is hard to explain, especially without um, graphics. Basically, what, what they discovered is, like, even when you fire single particles, one at a time, you know, space-separated, temporally separated, that interference pattern still manifests. You know, um, it's, it's as if, like, the photons that were fired earlier are somehow communicating with the photons that are fired later. And, and we don't know, 
how, how this works. We, we have that. But here's the thing. Fine. You know, we don't know how it works, but, it, but there, is, there is a cause to how it works. It's not a causal. It doesn't happen randomly. Okay, and that's the thing. You know, there's various kinds of like anomalies, various kinds of mysteries in quantum mechanics. You know, the double split slit experiment being one of them. But none of them, none of them um, lead to any justifiable conclusion that, that anything that's happening is, is happening without a cause. Okay, which leads to what I think everybody really understands now. And that's the idea that like, even if quantum mechanics was somehow random, you know, the behavior at the particle level or at the quantum level, particle behavior was random, that's not going to give you free will. You know, because like random by definition means that something's happening that's not caused, you know, because like because there's either randomness or causality. There's no third option. So so back back in, you know, the early 20s, you know, people thought that, all right, well, this, this Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the fact that you can't simultaneously measure the position and momentum of a particle leaves room for free will through this randomness. I, decades later, we realized, no, no, random, a ran, if, if, if our thoughts coming, are coming to us randomly, they're not coming freely because, like, a random thought would, would be not up to us. You know, it would be a, a thought with no reason. And let's go right into the randomness because, like, okay, Again, um, randomness by definition. One one definition of randomness. I mean, there's various definitions. I could like the the colloquial, common use definition of randomness is like, let's say I've got a deck of cards. I present them to you, and I say, all right, pick one out at random, meaning pick one out without you know deciding in advance which one's going to be. Pick one out without any kind of order, without any kind of like plan to it. Okay, that's kind of like that's apparent randomness. All right, but like when some physicists use the term in relation to, to human will in this question, they don't mean that kind of random. They mean that like, you know, at, that um, they claim that, that some phenomenon is happening, happening randomly in the sense of not being caused. Um, and I'll go through that, through that in, in a few minutes. But also the other, the other kind of way that they explain randomness is that um, some people define randomness as as that which is not predictable? Okay, yeah. If something's happening randomly, you know, you can't predict it. But that's not a good um, definition because, like, you know, ultimately, even with causal phenomenon, it's not completely um, predictable. In other words, like. To have to make a completely accurate prediction of anything, you have to have you have to know everything that's happening in the system, you know. So you basically, you know, since the universe is is the only closed system, since you know the the closed systems we refer to are only pseudo closed because there's there's one, you know, the universe is connected, you know, it's one. Uh, there is no um, there is no randomness. Okay. Um, all right. This I I realize this is like complicated this is like difficult to understand and like so I'm you know this is kind of like to people who've like taken a physics course and have been confused by this notion that that quantum mechanics somehow you know gives hope for um free will again the best that quantum mechanics and 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 actually I got I should have gone into this before I got about three and a half minutes it's not quantum mechanics that makes this claim of, of randomness, um, whatever. It's, it's actually the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is the interpretation of Niels Bohr and Heisenberg and a few others. But it was like, you know, other physicists like Einstein and Schrodinger and, and I think Pauli and all, they, they didn't agree. So it was just one interpretation that, interestingly, it's the interpretation of quantum mechanics that, that is taught in many schools still, in many colleges, because that's how far behind they are in this. Um, but that's what, that's what basically is making the assertion. It's not, quantum mechanics um, does not make an assertion about randomness or causality. Quantum mechanics is a system, mathematical system, for, for determining measurements, okay? It's the interpretation of quantum mechanics that's, that's at issue. Okay, so, um, all right, let's, let's, let's end with the, with the randomness thing. Um, again, 
everything has to have a cause. You can't have things happening that aren't caused. If, I mean, you can't even imagine that. Like, how could something happen that's not caused? So, like, so when you understand that, you understand that there can be no randomness. That there can be nothing that, that doesn't have a cause. You know, things, things can just can, cannot happen uncaused. But, you know, let's say that were possible. You know, let's say, you know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or the, the, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics was right. It's not, but let's, let's, let's say it was. So let's say there was randomness in nature. Again, um, if, if anything, if our decisions, if how we feel, if what we do, if what we think is, is based on random processes, on things that like aren't caused, then, then you cannot make the claim that, that what we think and do and feel and all is caused by our free will, by our will at all. You know, it's not caused at all. So again, that, that's a way to refute um, free will in that way. All right, we're, we're running out of time. And, you know, again, this has been a, a pretty complicated show. But, you know, for those of us who, who you know, wanted to get into the physics of, the, of this question, this pretty much answers it. You know, like quantum mechanics, it doesn't matter. I mean, like, you know, if it was random, it, it wouldn't give you free will. It's not random. It's causal. And that's what makes free will impossible. All right, well, you know, that's all we have time for today. Every Wednesday, uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, uh, we have a live show, 11 o'clock every, every Wednesday night. Um, you call in. If, if you don't live in Manhattan, um, just go to Manhattan Neighborhood Network's website and um, log on to Channel 2, and we're there for like a half an hour, 11 to 11.30. Call, ask us whatever you want, and we'll kind of like, you know, we, we like, it's a debate show. So we, we invite callers to try to defend the notion of free will. Nobody's succeeded. Nobody's come close to succeeding. All right, well, that's all we have time for. In the future, we're just going to be talking about why this question of human will is important, why free will is an illusion, and why the world overcoming this illusion of free will can benefit us all in many, many ways. Okay, thanks for watching and have a great day.